Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Policy Link panel organized by the Egmont Institute within the framework of the biannual EU in International Affairs Conference. We are sitting in the Palace of the Academies in the center of Brussels, right next to the Royal Palace, uh, staring at an otherwise empty room. So I feel a bit uh, as a talk show host, you know, from Larry King to Sven Bishop uh, in, in this case. Uh, but I hope that you are watching us uh, in large numbers uh, from, uh, from your seat. We've titled this panel Charm or Chasm, How to Deal with China. I think for a long time China um, tried and was very successful actually at charming uh, Europeans and, and in a way we still are, certainly if you look at the economic opportunities. But we've also seen, especially recently, that a certain chasm is opening up and it seems we're still exploring how best to deal with China. Just last December, the EU and China organ, uh, announced an agreement in principle on the CHI, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Then just a few months afterwards, the EU also adopted human rights sanctions against China. That seems to have taken the Chinese by surprise. Then, of course, China took countermeasures that then seemed to take many in Europe uh, by surprise. At the same time, while we are debating within the EU how to address China, uh, China increasingly is a topic on the agenda of NATO uh, also. And so the, the big question here for us is, how do we Europeans, uh, through the various organizations to which we operate, and at the national level, how do we address China? And uh, to um, enter this very difficult strategic debate, we have a panel uh, of four prominent speakers. I will first uh, pass the floor to Dr. Uh, Eva Gross. Uh, Eva, uh, whom I uh, learned to know first as a fellow uh, academic and was, among others, a professor here at the Vrije Universiteit uh, Brussel, but she's now a policy analyst in the China desk of the European External Action Service. Uh, afterwards, I will pass the floor to Roberto Zadra, who is head of the Global Partnership Division at uh, NATO. And uh, Roberto is sort of the, the, hi the hybrid part within this hybrid conference. So the, it's a hybrid conference and the panel as such is hybrid uh, again. But thank you, Roberto, for being able to, to be with uh, us. Um, then we will turn to the academic uh, half of the panel. We'll hear from Professor Luis Simon, who is the uh, professor at Vrije Universiteit Brussel, uh, and director of the Brussels office of uh, El Cano, which I shall describe as the Spanish Egmont Institute. Um, and since his face is hiding behind a mask, we don't know how that makes him feel. Um, and then finally, I will, I will give the floor to my own colleague at Egmont, Tobias Gerke, who's a research fellow at Egmont dealing with geoeconomics and a PhD candidate at Ghent University. There will be ample time for um, questions and, and answers. Uh, please do type all your deepest thoughts in the chat and I will uh, pass on the questions to the, to the speakers who will, first of all, uh, give us their introductory remarks about 10 minutes each. Eva, thank you for being with us and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Sven, and thank you for the organizers for the invitation. Uh, even though we can see the audience, uh, I'm nevertheless looking forward uh, to questions and comments we might receive, but also to hear about uh, the input from my fellow panelists. So I, uh, as you said, Sven, uh, our relations with China is uh, getting increasingly complex. I mean, it's always been complex, but we've not, we're now sort of in the middle of trying to um, reconcile uh, trends that are even more uh, increasingly diverging uh, and that are sort of exposing the um, sometimes uh, diametrically opposed um, aims uh, that we're trying to achieve vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So to begin with, uh, let's start with the negative, let's say, complexity. Uh, clearly, um, China doesn't share our values uh, internationally in foreign poli policy terms, geopolitically. Uh, China is increasingly assertive. Domestically, we're looking at increasing uh, nationalism, authoritarianism, if not uh, a path to totalitarianism. Uh, and that is reflected in China's uh, international engagement. Um, 
we see specifically over the course of the last year and a half now since the COVID pandemic hit uh, a rather aggressive Chinese um, COVID-19 uh, diplomacy, uh, first mask diplomacy with change to vaccine diplomacy. A and we've sort of, um, we're faced with a new diplomatic style as well. I mean, uh, Chinese diplomats increasingly adopt a sort of wolf warrior style of diplomacy and discourse vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, their host countries, sometimes targeting via social media also individual decision makers. And this, of course, uh, changes the tone uh, in which we, we interact with, with China and also the platforms, I mean, with Twitter becoming or remaining increasingly you know, prominent as a, as a platform. At the same time, uh, we remain economically interdependent Uh, you know, China has overtaken the U.S. as our largest trading partner in some aspects of the trade relationship, at least when you uh, talk about the trade in goods. Uh, and for at least one, but I know many EU member states, uh, you know, this economic dependence is, is quite real and also welcome in many ways. And even though we're more and more Uh, alert and more realistic to China's overall policy direction, uh, we know that the Chinese promise of investment remains quite attractive uh, to many countries uh, inside the EU, but also in the neighborhood. And this also determines uh, our scope of, uh, of action, let's say. So, and in addition to the economic inter interdependence, uh, we also face global challenges where we do need China's cooperation. I mean, think about climate change. I mean, the largest emitters remain uh, the U.S. and China. So if we don't persuade China to, you know, curb uh, emissions, um, then there won't be much uh, progress in our climate change objective. And in foreign policy terms, we, we are facing global challenges uh, from Afghanistan to Myanmar, where we also count and need Chinese engagement uh, and cooperation. So that's a bit the conundrum Uh, we face um, with China. And that's why our uh, strategic approach remains centered in the strategic outlook document from March 2019, uh, which defines China simultaneously as a cooperation partner, as in uh, the global challenges uh, that I just mentioned, as an economic competitor, and also as a systemic rival. When the strategy was first released, this was a bit... Uh, China certainly objected to this uh, definition uh, and some of our um, member states also uh, initially um, felt maybe a bit um, uncomfortable with this, um, with this terminology. But I think, uh, and unfortunately, reality has borne out that um, it's quite an accurate description of, of what we face um, with China. The, the um, multifaceted approach was reaffirmed last October, and we've just completed an implementation report on the progress of, of you know, um, implementing the strategy. Um, so this remains, despite uh, the recent sanctions and counter sanctions um, of, of last month, uh, and the fact that for now relations are, have become a bit more complex and, and sensitive remains our, our strategic approach that we uh, adapt, uh, adopt towards uh, China. Um, on the sanctions specifically, um, you, know, you know, the EU um, um, adopted sanctions towards uh, several Chinese individuals and one entity uh, in response to uh, human rights violations, forced labor in Xinjiang, uh, as part of a broader sanction package where several countries uh, were, were sanctions. Uh, and China uh, reciprocated with uh, sanctions of its own against uh, individuals and also European decision-making bodies. I mean, this is clearly unacceptable. Uh, our HRVP Burel also uh, pushed back uh, and, and was quite verbal about this at the Foreign Affairs Council when we heard about these Chinese counter-sanctions. Um, but we're now in a, in a situation where we, we continue to react uh, and, and sort of recalibrate our our engagement on China because it also there's also questions of what these counter sanctions actually mean uh, in practice and also how we uh, continue our engagement on files that, that matter. Again, I mentioned Afghanistan and Myanmar, uh, but also uh, climate change. Um, a couple of points on, on uh, sort of the, the, the finer points of implementing 
uh, our, our strategic approach. What I think is interesting is that in order to strengthen our position towards China, it's not only about our foreign policy toolbox, but many of the instruments are actually internal to the EU. Uh, for example, uh, the 5G toolbox sort of strengthening uh, our 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 uh, national systems uh, against um, risky risky technologies. Um, that's homework for the EU to take. Similarly, uh, screening foreign direct investments again internal to the EU business, not necessarily uh, an, an external policy dimension, but nevertheless really key to strengthen uh, the EU's uh, resilience and also our. Uh, protect us, uh, our markets, our member states against uh, Chinese influence and Chinese uh, takeovers of, of critical uh, industries inside the EU. Because the, one of the sort of um, key, uh, let's say, um, problems in our relationship with China is the lack of reciprocity and also transparency in terms of market access, in terms of opening uh, open pluralistic systems with China can exploit, but in return, we don't have the same sort of access to, to the Chinese market to sort of also message uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese political system and more importantly, Chinese population and, and society. So this is a bit um, the, the tricky line we need to walk between foreign policy, uh, but also strengthening our internal instruments to, to be able to stand up for our uh, interests and, and strengthen our resilience. Since 2019, we've also identified a couple of uh, new challenges that were not so explicitly mentioned in the document, but that have become more important. Uh, and these are um, Chinese disinformation and influence taking, uh, specifically in the, in the multilateral system. Uh, we've seen this quite clearly uh, with um, the COVID uh, mask and vaccine diplomacy. Uh, we do see more disinformation operations uh, that are uh, that are sort of instigated uh, by China, um, and we see um, also more, um, let's say, activities in the hybrid and cyber sector that also touch on uh, European interests and clearly on European security. Um, so, so here is a sort of field that I think um, is that we, we will need to look at in more detail uh, going forward. So now, what to do? Uh, in addition to our uh, sort of internal stock taking, um, unity among member states is, of course, one of the key issues. China is quite good at sort of uh, dividing, uh, trying to divide and conquer uh, or sort of attack or question EU unity. So this is something we've, we're quite pleased that so far uh, China has not succeeded in, in sort of uh, dividing uh, EU member states from their commitment to this multifaceted approach um, and uh, also to kind of uh, disrupt European solidarity in the face of sort of Chinese, uh, let's say, verbal attacks against individual member states or individuals, individual EU citizens. So I think this is something to, ex to be explored further. And secondly, and I think maybe that links uh, to the next speaker, it's also about working with others, working with like-minded uh, to sort of uh, emphasize community of values, to think together about how to, how to counter uh, some of uh, Chinese actions or uh, political initiatives, but also how to become better advocates for our pluralistic system our values and to think together about how we can um, induce uh, different behavior on the part of China because China is not going away. It's too big to ignore. Uh, it's only going to get, get bigger and more influential. It's also uh, adopted strategies and, and um, goals that make it quite clear what their global ambitions are. So I think we need to also um, coordinate and work together to try and induce uh, a change of behavior. Thank you very much, Sven, and I look forward to the next presentation. Thank you indeed, Eva. And uh, as you were talking, our number of participants uh, kept going up, so you're already recruiting uh, support for EU strategy. Um, over to uh, Roberto for uh, the perspective seen from uh, NATO. Roberto, please. Uh, thanks for 
having invited me to this uh, event. I'm sorry that I can't be there physically, but uh, as you know, I had to uh, do this for precautionary measure, as a precautionary measure. Anyway, so I will use my 10 minutes to address uh, four points. First, a short intro, then where we are in NATO with regard to work on China, then third, uh, two words on NATO relations with China, and uh, last, uh, I will say a few words on EU-NATO engagement with regard to China. Um, I speak in my capacity as a NATO official. However, I will try to play the Chatham House card to the extent possible by speaking up a little bit on a few occasions. So first of all, uh, intro and uh, background. Uh, let me start by mentioning the 2019 London Summit Declaration, where you know that uh, it stated that uh, the growing influence and in international policies present both opportunities and challenges and that NATO heads of state need to address together. So the message there was that there is an agreement by NATO heads of state that there is a role here also for NATO. Uh, some have observed that have observed that our wording was softer than the EU's. Uh, which in addition to opportunities and challenges, also described China as a systemic rival. rival. Uh, to this, I can only say um, NATO is a military organization and using the word rival, systemic rival, would have triggered comments about us moving to a cold war with China. Uh, you can observe, of course, that uh, comments about a new Cold War have in the meantime emerged in media and, and think tanks. That's true, but however, this did not come from NATO. Uh, the truth is that um, while some allies have no difficulty in describing China as a challenge or sometimes even as the most urgent threat, for example, Secretary of State Blinken did so at a speech in, back in March uh, in NATO headquarters. Uh, however, uh, other allies, they want to avoid uh, us going down an avenue where we have an adversarial relationship with China. And the Secretary General has also mentioned that in, in, in a number of speeches that he does not want that. Um, this, talking about the Secretary General, uh, he is aware that uh, on the one side he needs to ensure consensus in the alliance, on the other, he also wants to and does push the envelope. So sometimes in, in public speeches and press conferences, he is, um, let's say, forward leaning when it comes to China. For example, in the Raisin a Dialogue uh, not too long ago, conference organized by India. Um, in any case, irrespective of whether you push the envelope or whether you simply want to reflect consensus, both needs to be done. But allies, in any case, agree that we must be clear-headed about the challenges that come with China's rise. Um, then um, I don't know what language we will end up with at the NATO summit that is going to take place in a bit more than two weeks from now, on the 14th of June. But the Brussels summit communique will show us all whether we go away from the wording that we have or whether we add some wording. And then, of course, the more important document down the road will be the strategic concept that will be tasked by the summit and then is due for next year. Um, so second, uh, current work on, on in NATO on China. Uh, last December, in, in a press conference, the section mentioned that ministers had just agreed a comprehensive report that was done one year after the London summit. That report took uh, stock of work since London and assesses China's military development, its growing activity in our neighborhood, the implications for NATO resilience, and as well as for emerging technologies and critical infrastructure. Some of this has also been mentioned as by, by Eva as areas where the EU is active. Um, 
We expect another report to be ready in time for December when ministers are planning to meet again this year. So we are doing this at this point in time, there is a sort of annual exercise uh, and update. And it's again a stock taking effort and um, forward leaning uh, attempt to see what more we can do. Um, what's important when we look at uh, our understanding of China is that there is an increasing an increasing convergence of views, not only among NATO allies, but also with uh, our partners. And uh, you know that, uh, for example, uh, four of our partners, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea, participated for the first time at the foreign ministerial meeting uh, in, in December and also discussed the rise of China with us. Um, so there has been a steep learning curve when it comes to better understanding the rise of China and the implications for our security. And there is also an increasing convergence. Now, I need to add that I want to avoid any misunderstandings. Um, much of the work that we are doing goes to the heart of the Alliance's Article 5 mission. Uh, and it is mainstreamed, therefore it is not China specific. We have to look at these things from a 360 degrees perspective, not with China in, in mind. The focus of this work is not on China, but we cannot ignore the potential longer term challenges that are posed by China's rise. Now, very short on NATO relations with China, I don't need to expand on that. There are representatives level. Uh, however, the several the, the Chinese ministers in the margins of other such as the Munich Security Council, example, are regular engagements with the Chinese ambassador. He also uh, by the section and the de deputy general on arms control and non-proliferation matters. There are also high-level staff talks that we have been postponing for a while because of COVID, but we hope to get back to normal business soon. Um, all of this um, is not comparable to what the, what the EU does, but we have also our channels of communication and we use them with China. My last point is on NATO-EU engagements with regard to China. And here, let me start by, by saying, um, I'm sharing a little secret, it's not, it's not a secret, I am both a firm believer in European integration and also a committed transatlanticist. Because of that, I welcome all efforts to strengthen US-European relations. So both the EU-United States dialogue, which has not been mentioned so far, uh, as well as uh, efforts within NATO are useful both these both tools are useful instruments to achieve that goal, to promote European integration and uh, transatlantic relations. Also on China, um, one month ago, when uh, the resumption of the US-EU dialogue on China was announced, actually a bit more than a month, month ago, Secretary of State Blinken commented that we cannot approach Beijing most effectively when we are working we, that we can approach Beijing most effectively when we are working together and coordinating our approaches. That's also a point that Eva made. Um, this is uh, ideally also valid for NATO EU engagements when it comes to China. I'm now under Chatham House when I say that I look at EU-NATO relations with regard to China more from a glass half empty perspective than from a glass half full perspective. Um, we need a boost, we need to do more. We need to engage more frequently, more regularly, and in more detail on our respective activities with regard to China at various levels. Uh, the more we talk to each other and are able to present a united, coherent response to global challenges, including from China, the better are our chances to defend our values and convince China to adhere to rules and policies that are dear to us. Uh, let me conclude, however, with a 
positive note, um, there seems to be a momentum right now. We had some recent uh, staff to staff engagements uh, and we see merit in discussing this further, uh, hopefully also in future NAC PSC meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. And we immediately pass on to Luis, who will uh, look at this debate from the, an academic grant strategy perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. Thanks for the, for the invite. It's great to be here with some old friends, uh, new friends, and with Sven. Um, and, and also, uh, good, good afternoon to the, uh, to the hundreds of thousands of people watching us out there. Uh, so, Sven, you, you asked me to reflect uh, uh, about uh, American and European perspectives on, uh, to, on China, right? And, and Eva already touched on, on some of those points, and so did Roberto from, from a NATO angle. Uh, this is, of course, a very, uh, a very timely question because of the, also because of the upcoming summits, EU, US, and, and, and NATO in, in, in June. Um, I think that the, the, the notion uh, that Europeans and Americans would be um, able to sort of get on the same page or at least on a similar page on China, uh, was a lot harder to accept during the Trump administration, right? During the Trump years. Not least because Trump sort of framed the relationship with China as a sort of naked state-on-state uh, uh, -state power contest, i.e. China versus the United States. And also because it's so multilateralism and alliances, uh, uh, including the transatlantic relationship actually, as, as potential liabilities in a context of US competition with China. But the Biden administration seems to have a different approach. Uh, uh, it's sort of putting alliances and partnerships at the center of its China policy and at the center of its foreign policy. And it sees multilateralism and the so-called multilateral order and the transatlantic relationship specifically as potential assets uh, uh, in relation to how to deal with China, right? Not as liabilities. It, it's also sort of casting the China challenge uh, uh, as part of a broader struggle between democracy and autocracy and not just the naked power contest between China and the United States. And it also acknowledges the potential for cooperation with China on, on a number of things like climate or, or the fight against pandemics or other foreign policy files that Eva touched on uh, earlier, right? So th this new US approach is much more in line with European sensitivities, it seems to me. Um, so I think we're, we're likely to see convergence. In fact, we're already seeing convergence uh, on the China file. But there are also some, uh, some differences still that remain. If we take, for instance, the, the concept of multilateralism, uh, my sense is that, that the, the Biden administration keeps emphasizing, right? My sense is that the Biden administration, um, while the Biden administration is committed to multilateralism, its strong emphasis on democracy versus autocracy uh, 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 sort of de facto entails a pri prioritization of minilaterals rather than multilateral venues, right? Minilateral fora like the Quad with democracies. And that sort of clashes with the more expansive definition of multilateralism that the EU has traditionally had, which also includes uh, where everybody fits in, uh, where you get to talk to everybody uh, in multilateral venues, including China and including Russia. And and I think a good example of, of what I'm talking about is the Biden administration's uh, sort of uh, uh, renewed emphasis on the Quad uh, and all those different Quad Plus uh, uh, constellations, but also uh, it's growing interest in the G7 format. So I think there are several examples of this sort of minilateral bent, if you will. Um, so I would argue uh, um, that the Biden administration has a more instrumental and strategic approach towards multilateralism. So it sees it as, as potentially instrumental to advancing U.S. values, in this case, the democracy piece, uh, uh, and interests, in this case, U.S. interests in competition with China. Uh, but the EU has traditionally seen multilateralism as an end in itself. Uh, I, I, and I wonder to what extent this is changing. Maybe we can get into a conversation on that. Um, I, you could argue, I guess, and I would argue that in some ways the EU uh, or, or some parts of the EU are still stuck in some sort of 1990s paradigm and may, have, may not have come to grips with the idea that there is an inherent tension between preserving the multilateral system as we know it, as it is, and this return of great power competition that the executive vice president was alluding to earlier in the keynote speech, right? And you can, of course, see that uh, you, you, can, you can, of course, say or argue, as some people do, 
that multilateralism is part of the EU's DNA, right? In the sense that the EU itself is a multilateral entity. But I would be, and that's true, but, but I would be careful about projecting that uh, uh, idea externally because in an internal EU context, multilateralism is not unconditional. It does not come above everything else. Uh, a number of core values, such as democracy and the existence of an economic uh, level playing field, are a precondition for multilateralism within Europe. Um, so it's not clear to me uh, whether it still makes sense for the EU to embrace multilateralism as a sort of overarching frame uh, uh, of reference in its foreign policy, as it has done in the past. Especially as it becomes more and more clear that multilateral, inst multilateral institutions and arenas are become a uh, 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 norm, sorry, are becoming sort of arenas of great power competition. And that an expansive uh, 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 definition of multilateralism, uh, meaning one encompassing China, but also Russia, clashes uh, more and more frontally with uh, the promotion of, of, of some European values, uh, like democracy or economic openness uh, and reciprocity, for instance, in the case of China. Um, so I understand how trying to preserve multilateral institutions and norms is important, but not at any cost. So I guess it's, 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 it's about how to prioritize between different foreign policy objectives uh, while recognizing uh, tensions. And I think we're already seeing some of those tensions uh, come to the fore, uh, for instance, through the CHI uh, ratification process, right? Um, um, I, I, I guess um, um, another, another issue um, is that um, while the Biden administration sort of recognizes the potential for cooperation with China on, on some issues, um, it still sees the relationship as predominantly competitive, right? And Biden himself, uh, President Biden himself, has alluded to extreme competition and the fact that we should expect extreme competition between the United States of China and China. I think this is less the case for the EU, which sort of uh, recognizes the existence of points of friction with China, but still makes an effort to try and frame the relationship in cooperative terms. Although it seems to me, and also listening to the vice president earlier, that that space for cooperation may be narrowing a little bit. Um, um, but, 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 but still, I think it, it has a stronger role in the EU's narrative than it does in the American narrative, cooperation, when it comes to China. Um, I would say perhaps just before, before wrapping up that um, on, on the whole cooperation file, uh, which I think is important to, uh, to keep uh, as part of the toolbox, so to speak, uh, I, I realize that even in a context of competition and, and, and the Biden uh, administration recognized this, as I said, there are still issues that should be tackled uh, through engagement and cooperation. The I mean, the fight against climate change is, is a very good example, but also the fight against global pandemics, right? That require, because of their very nature, they require more sort of uh, global solutions. And that's what we're hearing from Biden's people. Uh, at the same time, and, and here's a question, I guess, or, or some issue for, for reflection, uh, as competition intensifies, uh, my sense is that the U.S. and China are likely to increasingly look at most global issues through the lens of how does this impact on our competition, right? Um, I'm not saying that the competition lens, if you will, will inform everything they do, or will dominate everything they do, uh, but uh, it will be present uh, when, when uh, discussing any other file, I think, including climate, I think. Um, because any strategy to fight, let, let's take climate because it's the best example, right? Calling for cooperation. Because I think any strategy to, fly, to fight climate change uh, 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 requires uh, far-fetching economic and political adjustments. And those adjustments are likely to trigger questions about who gets to you know, benefit more or less uh, uh, than the other, which are the types of questions that are typically uh, central when you are in a, in a, in a, in a head-on competitive relationship. Uh, of course, we can try to compartmentalize and make sure that some issues like climate or the fight against pandemics are kept in the cooperation box. Uh, and that's, I, I think, understandable and even legitimate. But it may also prove challenging, particularly if the overarching foreign policy frame is one of extreme competition or democracy versus autocracy. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now, Sven. Thanks. Thank you, Luis, uh, colleague, and your moi, ami colleague and a friend, as I say. Um, 
last but not least, uh, Tobias from the geoeconomic perspective. And geoeconomic, for your information, is written without a hyphen, I am told every time. Uh, thank you, Sven and colleagues, for yeah, inviting me to this panel also and getting me out of the home office into these royal chambers uh, on the occasion. Uh, I want to make three points uh, in the 10 minutes I have. Uh, I want to very briefly also address the EU-China investment agreement, which was already mentioned. Secondly, I want to uh, look at the bigger picture, geoeconomic competition, and how EU strategy, I think, uh, has to adapt to this. And then thirdly, you know, uh, come back to the EU-China relations, placing them in that context. So on the CHI, a lot of points to be made. Um, just on the economic and regulatory point of view, I think the agreement has, you know, is not really a game changer. If we look at the market access commitments of China in this agreement, uh, China has already made unilateral uh, commitments in the last two or three years that it then sort of copy-pasted in this agreement. The Chinese have also made commitments to the Americans a couple of months before uh, that it then extended to the Europeans. It's not bad, but it's not really moving the needle uh, significantly uh, on this um, front. On the regulatory front, if we say, how can this agreement uh, uh, help us uh, shape the behavior of Chinese state-owned enterprises, its uh, pervasive subsidies and so on, I would also caution that you know, China has made a lot of commitments in the past uh, 20 years ago when it acceded to the World Trade Organization. It already committed, I think, quite in strong language to all sorts of uh, stopping all sorts of practices. The problem is not so much the commitment, but how do we enforce it? And I wouldn't be too optimistic of uh, one more agreement that we have on that front. But that's, of course, only the, strategic, uh, the, the economic uh, dimension. There's, of course, also a strategic and certainly a normative dimension. But uh, in the interest of time, if there's interest, maybe we can come back to it. Because, of course, the agreement is now in the deep freezer. And uh, whether or not the Chinese will uh, leave the sanctions or, or, uh, or renounce the sanctions, I think you know, we, sh we Europeans would, I think, be well advised to move beyond this sky rather quickly. Because, in the end, it's just one... Uh, instrument, I believe, uh, out of many that the European Union has to uh, muster to, to position itself in this geoeconomic competition. And it's not the most instrument, uh, most important instrument at that, I believe. So, which brings me to my second point this geoeconomic competition that we all seem to you know, recognize uh, as, a, as a characteristic of international uh, global economic affairs now. But let me be clear what I think is the most important observation that we need to, to, to make. And that is that the powers compete for control. They compete for control of economic, of technological, and of innovation capabilities. And in doing so, not only do I think they really challenge the fundamental principles of the global economic order, but certainly also, of course, European economic and European national security. Now, we have understood that much more so. We now understand, it was mentioned many times, uh, well, uh, state-directed investments in European member states you know, might not all be good. There are certainly negative risks, uh, implications. We also seem to now understand uh, uh, after these three years that uh, Chinese suppliers uh, who work in critical infrastructure, i.e. 5G, is something that we have to look at in a different lens than just the economic lens. But that's really just two vectors. And there's so much more going on that, that we have to, I think, uh, understand and address. That's just the European market. In China, we see you know, increasing data restrictions based on national security motivations. We see uh, a technical standardization strategy of China that is really at odds with how we see technical standards that is also extending along the digital Silk Road in third countries. We see China has uh, increased its uh, legislations on export controls and other market restrictions. And you know, certainly the American economic uh, um, uh, confrontation under Trump with the Chinese, I think, has yeah, solidified uh, that strain in, in Chinese uh, strategy of decoupling of self-reliance that has always been there, I think, since Mao, uh, you could say. But uh, I think uh, after the Americans really confronted the Chinese, they have really solidified this strain of thought. And so the Chinese have themselves become much more geoeconomic, if you will. And as a response, the Americans were like, well, you know, we knew it all along in the Europeans. So what I'm saying is there's a certain dynamic at play, a geoeconomic dynamic. Uh, and that's really the, the, the crit critical point for, for us, I think, to observe and to understand, also not to 
to uh, to 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 um, you know, help that dynamic along too far because I think it goes down a, a pretty bad road. So European strategy, I think, has to. That's where we have to to address it. I think four key objectives for you and for a European geoeconomic strategy, if we want to have one, would be would be that first of all, ensure, of course, a fair competition for European companies uh, at home and abroad. The uh, classic level playing field. That's something that the Commission has been doing since its birth, and it's become much more assertive at that. But that's only one part. I think, secondly, we have to protect certain critical capabilities. We thirdly also have to promote certain critical capabilities. And fourthly, project also European norms, standards, and a, a, a vision, I believe. And the key is, of course, here, the word critical, or what is really critical to us. And that's, to me, the key debate we have to have uh, as the baseline or as the foundation to any strategy. That's a debate that has started already. You know, we were having this debate, definitely here in Brussels. Uh, the Commission has come up with all sorts of communications and, 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 uh, uh, and so on on what are critical goods, what are potentially um, vulnerable supply chains that, we, that, that feed input to the stuff we need to become green, to become digital. The Commission has also said, well, we would like to set up a critical technology observatory to analyze what are the emerging technologies that we have to understand, whether there are vulnerabilities, whether we have access to them also in the future. And the debate is also ongoing at the member state level. I think most interestingly is when member states adopt national uh, screen legislations. It's not just some law they adopt and uh, voila, that's it. But really, I think uh, it has been a kick-starting a nation, national debates on, uh, on what are actually the critical things we need to protect. And there has been quite a progression in many member states from very broad understandings that, well, of course, it's the ports and the airports and the energy grids and so on, to now very narrow and uh, forward-looking uh, uh, conceptualizations there are certain emerging technologies which have various applications that might be uh, might uh, bring vulnerabilities to our economic systems, to our democratic systems. So there's a lot of uh, development, and I think here uh, there is more to do. Though we have to set up, I think, in Europe some sort of structures to not only react, reacting to well. Now we know 5G is something we have to react to. We have uh, we have to react to Chinese investments that are already in Europe. But there will be more things to come and, and getting ready for these future uh, 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 things will be, think, uh, important. So there's a certain governance aspect, I think, for the EU to set up new governance structures with member states, with the commission, with experts that can more proactively address these, these issues that are at the, at the nexus of technological, economic and security vulnerabilities. Finally, uh, um, let me say one thing about how the EU-China relation uh, question comes in here, maybe. And yeah, the debate on China partner, competitor, rival is, of course, very interesting, but it's not really operational at all. Because when, when exactly is it then a competitor? When is it a rival? It's very uh, easy to have it all three at the same time. And then you can say, well, now it's a partner, uh, maybe now it's a rival. But yeah, in fact... Maybe it is like this, because in the end, if we look at the very specific issues, if we build a strategy or an affair with China on the issue-specific questions, um, then I think it's always a mix of, of, of offensive, of defensive, uh, as Eva said, of foreign policy, of national, but domestic policy, of multilateral, of bilateral, and of unilateral efforts. And there's lots of examples, I think, where this is already happening. Uh, you know, one issue is uh, right now, I think, uh, how do we cooperate? Well, how do we continue to cooperate with China on science and innovation? Um, there's lots of issues on the table, the, non, uh, the, the protection of intellectual property, the transfer, the illegal transfer of technology, the transfer of know-how and so on. So how do we address this? And I think the Commission has really... Uh, change or the EU, EU as a whole has changed its strategy from one that was primarily maybe multilateral, it has launched a case at WTO in 2018, for example, to clarify what are the rules on forced technology transfer. Ideally, the World Trade Organization would come up with a clarification, what is allowed, and also with enforcement tools. Um, but at the same time, you know, the EU has engaged in a, in a bilateral negotiation with the Chinese and a 
joint framework on science and cooperation where it tries to also set red lines. This is where we can cooperate. This is what we need. These are the norms we need to agree on. This is the transparency we need to agree on. And finally, it has uh, done a lot on the unilateral front. Uh, most recently, uh, the, Europe, uh, the EU's Horizon Europe framework, the, the flagship research uh, program, now uh, with its reform can uh, bar third countries from participating in very critical projects where there is critical technologies that might be uh, um, developed uh, with an eye to China, of course. So, yeah, in the end, there is, I think... Um, uh, this is just one example I find out of the many where um, uh, actually on all fronts uh, we can build an issue-specific China strategy. Yeah, finally, let me just conclude that um, I think in recent two, three years there's been a lot of focus on the protection front of how do we protect our economic affairs uh, from the vulnerabilities that we have specifically with China. Now it's more about how do we promote the critical capabilities. So a lot of focus, I think, on industrial strategy, on the kind of finance mechanisms we have, but I would also think that the projection part that I highlighted earlier is really the most maybe important one. And there I think the EU unfortunately is still lacking to develop a, a vision, a foreign policy vision also of how the global economy is changing. Uh, it, we're not the only ones who see this convergence of security, of technological, of digital, or sustainability issues that collide at full speed with, the, uh, with, glo uh, with economic questions. And so I think that this we need to address also in a new kind of foreign economic policy. Unfortunately, the most recent trade strategy came out a few weeks ago, didn't really, I think, capture that and didn't really have an ambition beyond, you know, sort of basic uh, classic trade and investment agreements. So a global connectivity strategy, that's something that's discussed here in Brussels uh, in the back rooms, but no one really cares about yet is really, I think, uh, where the EU could, uh, have an, uh, could, could address this ambition of, of projecting also a vision externally. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Tobias, and thank you again, all four of you. Were this an actual talk show, we would now have a little musical interlude by the House Orchestra, maybe something uh, for the next uh, uh, edition. Um, absent that, let me pick up uh, the questions that are coming in uh, through the, the chat. Um, I'll, I'll give you three of them and feel free, of course, to, to pick and choose. From Mr. Sokhrab Sadodin, who is at the University of Tehran. Interesting question, very concrete. Did the, uh, the CHI hurt transatlantic uh, agreement uh, when it comes to, uh, to China? Um, question from uh, Epamenondas Tripkos, one of our, our students at, at VUB. Um, who, who ask whether the reason that we are so confused in a way is that, that we don't have a clear long-term strategy and China has. We specifically ask whether, whether China's strategy is building communism. Personally, I think they've long abandoned that. Uh, but, but in a way, it's irrelevant. But, but do they have a long-term strategy and, and have we not? And is that the cause of our troubles? And then there is a question from Professor uh, Sofia Kalanzakos, who's uh, in the uh, Abu Dhabi campus of New York University, um, who, who says, how can you compartmentalize climate when it's such a big and important horizontal issue? But I think the, the, the misunderstanding is that we're not compartmentalizing climate. We're saying within our relations with, with China, you compartmentalize different issues. You have issues on which you can cooperate uh, while you disagree on other issues. And that's a compartmentalization. Uh, she does make an interesting point and say, what about the um, what about the, the developing world? Is it just, you know, um, will everything be settled by how the big the big players uh, deal with this? I'm paraphrasing here, or how how does the rest of the world com come into that? Let me let me add uh, a reflection of of my own. Two reflections are closely linked. To which extent ought it to be our objective to change China domestically? I mean, is that part of what we are trying uh, to achieve? If so, which instruments do we have? Uh, and, and very much linked to that, but more overall, how do you see actually the, the end state? You know, what would be an ideal end state that we arrive, uh, arrive at here? Um, so uh, please pick up the points that you would like to pick up and of course feel free to, to react to the other panelists. And I propose we just take uh, the same over again, Eva. 
Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, very interesting um, panel presentation. And uh, from the audience, uh, I'm, I'm really um, amazed how international <laughs> the origin of the, the, the um, questioners or the participants are. Yeah, true, but I don't think so. No. Um, let me react to uh, a few of them. So I, I don't think Kai heard uh, the transatlantic Uh, relations. Uh, I, I know there were maybe expectations from the U.S. side uh, that we would wait, uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, well, we had four years of uh, a rather uncooperative uh, U.S. administration, uh, and also maybe in the view of uh, some high-level EU and member state official, a unique opportunity uh, to conclude negotiations in what had been a sort of long-ranging and difficult uh, negotiation process. Uh, and uh, in a way, um, uh, you know, China is very focused on, the, on its own relationship with the U.S. And sometimes the relationship towards the EU or the behavior towards the EU is sort of a consequence of uh, objectives uh, that China has towards the U.S. So I think uh, there was a feeling that the moment was right to conclude the kind negotiations um, before things change again. So I think, uh, and I think the, the Washington also uh, understood that. Um, and on, on Luis's point on, on multilateralism um, and how the U.S. views uh, China, I think what was uh, interesting also during the Trump years that I think we have very similar, um, very similar analysis and conclusions on what China does and what the Uh, potential implications are. We just have differed on on the policies in response to that. Um, and I think the continuity between the Trump and the Biden administration is that China is a bipartisan issue in the U.S. So there's very little disagreement on on what the rise of China uh, represents uh, for uh, for the U.S. But it's also true that the tone has changed uh, quite dramatically uh, since um, the, the change of administration. Um, Two points here. I wanted to just sort of um, highlight that, you, you know, I mean, I think uh, China, I mean, one of the objectives we, we have, and I think we feel quite strongly, and I think also on the other side of the Atlantic, that our approach differs from China uh, to Russia also because with China, we have a very multifaceted relationship and we talk uh, and we try and find ways of engagement and cooperation, uh, which is quite different to where we are at the moment with Russia. And I think there's a Uh, sort of also realization that we we would not want our relations with China to go down uh, the road of of uh, of our current relations uh, with Russia. I think that's that's a value uh, that we attach to our EU China relationship, and I think that's also worth uh, remembering. And then just on the multilateral issue, I think. Um, beyond how the U.S. and the EU view multilateralism and what our priorities are for that. I think what's also quite interesting, and, and here the return of the U.S. to multilateralism, to the U.N., to the U.N. Security Council, is, is really important because China sort of took advantage of this uh, transatlantic absence. Uh, and we've seen sort of significant engagement by China on personnel issues in the U.N., Uh, on, on trying to sort of subvert uh, certain multilateral bodies to sort of prevent statements on human rights, for example, um, to sort of undermine uh, sort of multilateral norms or sort of using um, the UN to promote their own multilateral norms, for example. So I think beyond the question of do we stick to multilateralism or not, uh, it's also how do we define multilater multilateralism and how do we ensure that the multilateral system and, and the norms we've created remain true to their origins rather than uh, become uh, changed um, and amended uh, by, by Chinese, specifically Chinese. I mean, China is not the only, uh, you know, actor in the UN that's sometimes promoting uh, different, different values and, and has different conceptions of human rights, for example. But again, being the biggest, its biggest player and a Security Council member, it's... Uh, of some consequence, what they do. So I think I would look at this multilateral question uh, also from that angle. Uh, on And on um, connectivity, uh, and that relates, I think, to the question of the developing world, 
uh, I think this Chinese foreign policy vision of Belt and Road and sort of uh, creating um, added value and investment along also in developing countries is something that I think the, the Europe's approach to connectivity, which, yes, we've outlined in the connectivity strategy to Asia, um, but of, of course the... the the idea behind it is also global, uh, goes global. That we we would we we're trying what we're trying to communicate also to developing countries is that any investment from a third country or um, or infrastructure project uh, should be sustainable and to the benefit of the country involved, not to the country that uh, uh, makes the investment. Uh, so we're trying very. Um, increasingly hard. I mean, we have tried, and I mean, maybe it's also a question of communicating that in forums like here, uh, that we're, our approach to connectivity also has a global uh, idea behind it and, and also in the sense of creating sustainable um, investments, infrastructure projects, standards um, that are to the benefit of, of the countries involved. And, um, and that's how we, in part, how we address developing countries in this EU-China relations. Thanks. In a question that I think is um, mostly addressed to you, came in from Dr. Um, uh, uh, Scott uh, Brown at the University of Dundee about the 17 plus one. And he asks, uh, is it, do, you, do we think it's about to un unravel now that I think Lithuania is the first country to, to leave the 17 plus one? I used to say, you know, jokingly, one we have to get out of it would be for everybody to join in and then it would lose its added value. Uh, but now we actually see a country leaving. Or everyone leaves at the same time. But uh, Well, I mean, on the 17 plus one or now 16 plus one, um, you know, the EU's, uh, our official position has been, and I think, you know, it's a it's an individual national decision to, to join or to participate in the format. So we don't, you know, the EU is an observer to the process. We're not a full member. Um, we 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 have our sort of concerns over whether this sort of trans-regional dimension is compatible uh, with uh, with uh, European integration. Um, but again, that's for the participating countries to decide. But I think uh, you know the the fact that one country has left um, is a certain sends a certain signal um, that Absolutely. shouldn't be underestimated. I think. Thank you. Um, Roberto, please. The questions, none of the questions were really for me, but I pick up the second one uh, that was saying China has a strategy, long-term strategy. What is our long-term strategy? Um, I think that you can answer this from various corners. I would say that our strategy must be to come to a win-win situation. Um, a win-win situation where we can engage with China, but also be firm on issues where we have disagreements. Um, I don't remember which minister, maybe it was Blinken some time ago in a press conference, who roughly said, uh, cooperate where we can, compete w if uh, we're possible, but respecting the rules and face if we have to, something like that. He didn't say, he didn't use these words, but essentially you have to engage with China on all of these, all of these fronts. Um, one observation and so the strategy long-term should be to come to a situation where we can cooperate together, but also we have to be firm and defending in defending our values, our rules. There is a competition of what, what is the rules-based order now. You've seen that in the press. We talk about an international rules-based order. When I say we, it's not NATO, it's all of us. And they say what rules-based order is yours. So there is even a discussion on that. But uh, one comment that uh, is also triggered by what Eva said, um, I would argue that we need to be careful not to put China and Russia into one basket. 
Uh, yes, there are commonalities on a number of points, for example, in the opposition to what we think is the rules-based order, the international rules-based order, and a number of other issues. However, there are also differences between both. And um, for example, you sometimes hear, uh, when it comes to Russia, you sometimes hear comments about uh, wedge driving. You hear comments about Russia trying to divide us when it comes to uh, developing responses. Um, what we need to do, on the other hand, is we, we need to be careful not to bring them together. They are not a unity. There are differences between both countries. There's a different interdependence that we have with, this, with, with these two countries. We should not put them into the same basket. Um, you know, there have been lots of articles uh, about addressing the question, who lost Russia? Uh, I don't want to see a scenario in the future where we look back and say, who lost China? So we need to look at this also from a win-win perspective, uh, or at least uh, looking at that as a strategic outcome longer term. Thanks. Thank you, Roberto. Well, that was the, the question in the US, of course, uh, after the, the creation of the People's Republic in 49, uh, who, lost, who lost China. Uh, unwittingly, you answered the question by a colleague, Professor Tom Zarr from Antwerp, who, who said exactly that, should we be, not be careful not to put China and, and Russia in the same, in the same basket? Um, so that was perfect on, on, on your part. Uh, thank you. Uh, Louis, please. Thanks, Van. Just just a few um, a few comments uh, on on some of the points that have been raised in no particular order. Uh, well, first, I mean, I take Eva's uh, sort of point on multilateralism. I think I think you're right. There's an element of of that. The U.S. coming back and sort of uh, checking uh, China's uh, influence or the influence that China sort of uh, managed to accumulate during the Trump years. I think I think that's right. I do still see a sort of like a, a, a preference towards more minilateral fora, but let's let's see how that evolves. Um, uh, I also agree with Eva that uh, uh, the, the notion that China is a competitor uh, is, is is a bipartisan uh, one in, in the United States, and I think this is actually very relevant. Uh, in fact, I think it seems to me that 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 Biden is actually m more focused on China even than Trump was, right? And if you if you look at the interim uh, national strategic guidance, uh, China is much more clearly prioritized over Russia than it was in the in Trump's t uh, 2017 national security strategy, where both were sort of labeled as long-term strategic competitors. There was an implicit prioritization of China, but explicitly at least they were sort of put at the same level in terms of uh, uh, the challenge they put to the US. Whereas now in Biden's uh, interim national strategic uh, uh, guidance, China is clearly uh, uh, put on top and there's language, I mean, I, I can't remember the exact language, but something along the lines of China is the only country that is uh, uh, in a position to sustain a, a long-term challenge to the international order. Um, on, 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 on the Kai question, uh, um, just to add a different perspective to Eva's, uh, uh, to try and bring in the the uh, what or what I've heard from uh, from uh, from American colleagues is that uh, their perception uh, from Biden's people and entourage is is, is typically uh, well, yes, there was an opportunity because because of Biden's election and the Chinese thought uh, that they needed to preempt a potential align transatlantic alignment on China. So they sort of uh, became more open uh, to negotiate uh, certain points that had been blocked in the past. So they were actually trying to drive a wedge uh, between Europe and America. And uh, this uh, European argument that uh, the Americans were not consulting us when they were negotiating with China, what, what Biden people said, yes, but that was Trump. And our point precisely was to change that. And you didn't make it easy for us with that sort of uh, um, Early, uh, uh, early uh, present into the into the Biden administration, right? That's sort of the the what what uh, what um, what I've heard from uh, from Biden's people on 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 that. Uh, now it's true that uh, 
uh, it seems to be bringing the two sides together, right? Because of the because of the uh, deep freeze of of Kai, uh, because of values, and 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 I think this links to a broader point, which is that by linking China um, to the values conversation and to democracy versus autocracy, it's going to be a lot easier for the U.S. Uh, to get traction with Europeans on 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 China, and we've seen it with we've seen it with human rights. Trump didn't play that card. In fact, quite the opposite. He was reluctant to play uh, the values card, which ironically is an effective uh, one in terms of bringing Europeans uh, closer on China. Now, on your question, Sven, uh, should we change China? I think there are two elements to that question. To, to that question, the first, well, in my mind, I'm sure there are many more. Uh, 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 first is, is that realistic? Probably not. Probably not. Right. I mean. Uh, in fact, the, the U.S. narrative for way too long has been like by bringing China into the international system and, and cooperating with them uh, and turning them into a responsible stakeholder, this, uh, this well-known expression, uh, that will trigger uh, uh, long-term economic and political reform in China and they will, they, will, they will be more in line economically and politically. Well, we know that that hasn't happened, right? So then uh, uh, how do you do it? Uh, so the first question is, is it realistic? My sense is probably not. And the second, the second element of that question is, uh, uh, I, my sense is that it would be too escalatory, right? That would be perceived as offensive, right? You're trying to toy with, the, uh, with their domestic political system. Uh, so there's, there's a debate, uh, I understand, in the United States about this, right? As in, should you keep it to um, balancing slash containment, although that's, that's a word that people don't want to use in a, in a China context, but should we keep it? Should we, should you keep it defensive and to balancing, or uh, should you should you go on the offensive? And and that's about you know promoting democracy within China, and uh, and so on. It's, I mean, it's a strategy, but I think it would be it would be quite escalatory. So you need to be prepared to deal with the consequences of that. Could you argue then to to push a little bit that or to say, many many in the EU who push to to put human rights from the center of our China policy perhaps are not aware of how escalatory that actually is? That's my sense. But perhaps Eva differs. Yeah, please. <laughs> and uh, the EU is playing an offensive strategy. No, I, mean, I think uh, kudos to you that um, to argue that um, changing China or reaching a domestic change is uh, um, um, possible. I mean, my reaction to that was, I, you know, I mean, the Chinese... Uh, system, social media space, a journalism space is, is closed. I mean, we have fewer and fewer European or even uh, US, uh, well, let's say Western quote unquote, uh, journalists that are able to, uh, to visit China, uh, researching China, traveling to China on a sort of people to people uh, track is becoming increasingly difficult. So I think even if we wanted to kind of reach, I mean, reaching the Chinese population, I mean, the, is quite limited in what we can do. So, I mean, uh, and I think that sort of uh, narrows even to me uh, um, abstract uh, thinking of would we want to change Chinese society or not. I mean, clearly it's something the, uh, the political system is trying its best to avoid. It's afraid of. Um, so I think we're we're better off trying to shape uh, international behavior, um, and some of this behavior I think touches probably also on domestic uh, issues. But I think if we were just in terms of strategy, as uh, I mean, uh, targeting uh, domestic change, we would uh, I think this would backfire quite badly um, because we see we see what the the reaction is and i mean i guess we're trying to change uh, domestic behavior in terms of uh, forced labor and forced sterilization in xinjiang and uh, that's uh, i think um, yeah a, a priority but but quite uh, difficult um, that that would be thank you tobias please yeah thanks let me also um, give my two cents on the on the kai question of course, I cannot judge how some people in the American government might feel about this. But it would be, I find, silly if it would upset transatlantic relations. Because, yeah, let's look at what, what is there. There is the phase one agreement that, sure, Trump negotiated, but it's an incredibly one-sided agreement that puts Europe at a uh, major disadvantage. It's a terrible agreement, 
But if Biden administration would be really about a new leadership on China, why wouldn't they renounce this agreement? They won't, because it's very, you know, it's incredibly one-sided. If the Americans would renounce, I think I would have no problem with the Europeans also renouncing on that basis, on a transatlantic partnership, uh, the CHI. But of course, it won't happen. And nothing in the sky, I think, restricts transatlantic cooperation in any sense. First of all, much of this agreement is based on, um, on most favored nations. So all the good stuff that the Europeans get, most other countries, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Americans, get as well. Uh, and secondly, uh, there is, uh, the Europeans have, you know, have offered, they're working with the Americans in, a, in another framework, in a trilateral meeting, where they address all these aspects on, on, on state subsidies, on forced technology transfers, the economic aspects, together with the Americans and the Japanese uh, to reform the WTO. The Europeans have also offered a trade and technology council to the Americans, to the Biden administration, where also these issues could be taken forward, even more forward together. Um, and so, you know, all, all things together, I think uh, that... You can build easily, I think, still transatlantic cooperation on China on these issues, um, and the Kai would, I believe, not upset that. Let me try also uh, a few thoughts on this uh, climate uh, question on China, because um, yeah, it seem, we all seem to agree always that what do we cooperate with the Chinese again on? Ah, yeah, it's always climate, and yeah, sure, we have to cooperate, right? There are very, um, there are many international climate issues that obviously we have to cooperate. Paris Agreement was one, updating the Paris Agreement, etc. But at the core, I think we also have to compete. We're already doing it. Uh, the Chinese recognize this. I think also the Europeans recognize this in driving uh, new technological development and pushing money into green technologies and to setting the standards of becoming the, the global player in these technologies is, is a hardcore competition for uh, leadership. And the Chinese, uh, if you look at what the strategic critical sectors they have identified, I think five out of 10 or something are emerging or, or green uh, 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 climate issues from electric cars to batteries, etc. The Europeans the same, the whole industrial policy push, I think, has of course also other issues like semiconductors, microchips. Maybe that's not really about climate per se, but the whole question we have to develop batteries, uh, we have to develop hydrogen energy. This is, of course, about the climate, but let's face it, this is really about uh, who becomes the leader in these new uh, technologies uh, uh, and then also, of course, gains the economic uh, spoils from this. So let's not focus, in other words, too much on this. Now, also, cooperation is necessary. We have to agree on common rules. We have to... Uh, um, yeah, we have to make sure that uh, the climate laws in Europe are, uh, that, that they are not disadvantaging us. We have to negotiate with the Chinese that, and other countries to adopt also strong legislation nationally, of course, and internationally. But it's only uh, one dimension. Thank you. We got an, an overall question from um, Jonas Weinberger or Jonas Weinberger. I don't know whether he's writing from Germany or from the US. Um, uh, which is maybe a good question to, to lead to, to, to final comments. He asks, overall, are we not too, too reactive? And in a way, you could say that, that China often sets the tone, right? The whole world is talking about the BRI, and, and so often a lot of what we do is then seen, at least, as a reaction to the BRI, and that's just one example. So, um, but, but if we're not, if we want to be proactive, then what does that mean? On which topics do we do that? Um, what what could we um, what could we offer to China, but also I would say to to, to other countries to somehow um, shape the debate uh, again more more than we have done in the past. Maybe we can uh, go in reverse um, order this time. So Tobias, your brilliant last thoughts of the panel, because your last thoughts are for your tombstone, and that's not for a while yet. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I try to um, also address this quickly in my, in my first remarks. And yes, I think uh, uh, even though I recognize that on the geoeconomic front, there has been a lot of change in, in the EU. 
the Commission and the member states have adopted, I think, uh, uh, is, and are adopting, uh, are in the process of adopting uh, so many more, much more assertive and, and uh, also unilateral policies. But yeah, almost all of them, I think, are indeed reactive. I gave the examples of uh, investment screening, of 5G um, uh, technology. Uh, Huawei is already in so many countries. Of course, we can still rip them out, but it uh, has shown one of the complications is that we have realized this too late. And the costs of doing so are now um, quite high for some countries. And you know, we can extrapolate that these examples, I think, across the board. That's why I was... Uh, one of the um, um, things to do for Europe is, I think, you know, how do you become more proactive? Um, and yeah, there are, of course, limitations, mostly because many of the uh, uh, competencies, of course, split up between the Commission and the member states, uh, not only on security policy, but I'm thinking of now the push for industrial policy, where there's a lot of development here in Brussels. I think the Commission really wants to. It has published uh, great um, strategy papers, I find, but it doesn't really have any money. Now, there's now the recovery fund, of course, but that's a one-off. And what after that? Uh, you have to always cooperate with the member states, and that's tedious. But I think, at least on some issues, um, uh, there have to be some sort of different governance set up so we can be more proactive to analyze things that are advanced, like the Commission has uh, proposed, for example, on these critical technology observatory. I don't know how it's going to look like, but it sounds more of a proactive thing. What is coming up in the next years? What might be possible vulnerabilities coming up when, it, when new technologies are emerging? And what are possible future uh, issues? Uh, the EU also recently agreed, for example, on export controls. Uh, also very difficult compromise between the member states and the Commission, but I think it could be also a platform where they come together and say, okay, what is the future of technologies that we maybe not everything we want to export? Are there certain frontier technologies um, that we might be, even though they might not directly feed into a military application in China, maybe we don't want to export them because there are certain uh, risks. Anyway, it, it's about, I think, um, these different structures uh, uh, a sort of I was, I was uh, writing about an economic security council on the European basis where um, um, where we can uh, analyze these things more structurally and hopefully come to more uh, foresight let's say and a more proactive policy that doesn't only get information from the Americans of what things are currently risky <laughs> Thank you uh, Louis Thanks, Sven. Just, just very quickly to go back to, to Kai. So I, I don't think that upsetting or having a negative impact on the transatlantic relationship means that a transatlantic cooperation on China is suddenly over or there are no other tools. It's, it's about having a, a negative impact. Of course, life goes on and there are multiple other venues to, uh, to, uh, to discuss China for, for the EU and the US. So Kai is not, was not dramatic. It didn't have a dramatic impact on on the transatlantic relationship, but I think it did have a negative. Uh, to the extent that it had an impact on the transatlantic relationship, it was negative. Um, and the criticism, as I understood it, was more about political signaling, about the Chinese trying to drive a wedge and, and Europeans playing ball for other reasons, for their interests. But that was not that was not welcome uh, in the early stages of the of the of the Biden administration. Um, the the um, I think on, on the proactive question, I think that the, the emphasis on, on political values and democracy and democracy versus autocracy, I think that's a good example of a proactive turn uh, in strategy, right? On, on the part, in this case, of the Biden administration. Uh, and uh, uh, Vice President Vestager talked uh, this morning about linking that normative agenda uh, to technology and digitalization, right, and 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 and, and seeing them as in, intrinsically uh, a part of the same of the same thing. I think if the U.S. and the EU manage to agree on that, and there are challenges, privacy related and other issues, uh, and get this uh, transatlantic trade and technology council uh, running, uh, either at the upcoming summit or or later on and and bring others around and the vice presidents also alluded to the importance of that and the japanese the indians and so on uh, that would be an example of, of something proactive and something i think quite effective uh, in terms of uh, how you handle the china file excellent thank you uh, roberto please 
Thank you. So I'll just pick up the question whether we are not too reactive overall. And I would say probably yes. Um, you have to uh, look at this from uh, various corners. One is the US reach out to Europe under the Biden administration. Um, you, some, it's not for me to comment what the EU is doing, but you will have to um, tell me whether you are being fast enough in picking this up or whether you're too slow and reactive. Um, I think we are still too slow, and that's why I, in the beginning I mentioned the glass half empty perspective is the one I prefer to use uh, because we need to do more. Um, it, we need to do more when it comes to US-EU relations with regard to China. We need to do more in NATO when it comes to discussing China. We are doing a lot, but we need to do more. And we need to do more and better when it comes to NATO-EU relations when it comes with regard to China. It cannot be that I read Politico to find out what the EU is doing or the other way around. Uh, so we need to do better in having one side of Brussels talking to the other side of Brussels. Uh, so maybe I can add to say uh, on, on the question whether we are too reactive, which means we're slow, too slow. Um, I can only speak for NATO here. Uh, it's 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 known that uh, NATO is a, is not a fast moving animal. It it starts to move slowly, but once it is in motion, it keeps going. So I hope that is also valid for, <laughs> for both sides of Brussels. I think it is. Um, and maybe last but not least, uh, uh, maybe we have been right in not being too reactive uh, under the Trump administration, because uh, all of us, uh, that was a different uh, game. Uh, it was more challenging to... Um, come up with common lines with the Trump administration. As a number of you have mentioned, the tone has now changed. The substance, uh, there is continuity, uh, certainly in Washington, in how to address China, and I, I welcome that. Let's not forget that the Trump administration, even if it was difficult, uh, I at least acknowledge that it was the time of the wake-up call that we got from Washington when it comes to China. So I think we are now more clear-eyed when it comes to understanding and assessing China than we were before the Trump administration. So I'm not defending or criticizing the Trump administration unduly, but it was during those years that we got the wake-up call in Europe. Thanks. Thank you, Roberto. And finally... Eva, the final word is for you as the embodiment of the oh, union in well, this case. Thank of you. <laughs> well, I wanted to um, make a final point on, on the transatlantic uh, issue that we've been discussing so much. Um, uh, you know, the EU-US dialogue on China took place today. The, the press release has just come out. So I think that's the fact that this has um, continued from the Trump to the Biden administration, and then it was kind of sort of a, a first uh, a priority for both sides. I, I think shows that the the damage, the imaginary damage done by the Kai is uh, quite uh, limited. I mean, I think we have a good uh, a good uh, track record and um, uh, structures in place to discuss China in a transatlantic setting. And I think on the Kai, uh, I think. You know what? What any agreement that pushes China to uh, improve its sustainability, if you know, the, thanks to the Kai, uh, China does ratify ILO conventions uh, on forced labor. I think that'll also benefit uh, not just the EU but also other other countries. So I think this is a false. Um, uh, I think a false dichotomy um, that that we're making. Um, and then on, on the questions on China as an early riser um, and the symbolism, I mean, yes, of course, I mean, the Belt and Road Initiative, I mean, it's a, it's a great brand. I mean, and China was able to push it uh, quite forcefully. Um, so kudos to them. Uh, but of course, they have a, a closed system where decision making and instructions uh, are, are much easier to translate than in a, in a multi level pluralistic uh, system like the EU where competences are 
sitting in different, uh, you know, either in the capitals or they're with different sectors or even subnational uh, uh, bodies. So it, it just takes us longer um, to sort of uh, form a position. Uh, but I think as previous speakers have said, once we've done that, uh, even democracies are quite good at then, uh, you know, implementing them and sort of uh, forming a counterweight uh, to, 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 in this case, uh, China. So it just, I think, has taken us a, a little bit, uh, some time to develop a realistic approach and to raise the awareness amongst key actors here in Brussels, but also in the capital. But I think now that we've done so, um, I think we're in a very good position to to think about uh, countermeasures. And just lastly, on this multifaceted approach, I think, and we have to get used to the ambiguity and the difficulty of holding uh, several elements uh, at once, uh, even if they're kind of slightly uh, contradictory sometimes. But China is all for a rival, a competitor, a negotiating partner, and a cooperating partner. And I think... That's going to be the, the challenge for us going forward. I think that's a good line to end on, uh, Eva. Even democracies are quite good. Let's make that the conclusion of the panel. Good, yes. uh, thank you, Eva. Thank you, Roberto, Luis, and Tobias. Uh, thank you in the, uh, the virtual audience for all the questions also. Um, that concludes uh, our panel. Uh, I hope that, uh, that all of you will also enjoy uh, many of the other panels at this conference. Meanwhile, uh, those of us who are here have earned an alcoholic beverage, uh, and uh, this being uh, one of the first to be enjoyed indoors and collectively, I think we shall do that. Thanks again, and, and see you in one of the next panels. Thank you.